specific time. Are you ready yep. to get started? I'm ready. All right. Um, for everybody online, thank you so much for joining us today for Hatfield Marine Science Center's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for today. Um, we are on Zoom, as we have been for a long time, and uh, so just a quick reminder that we do have your mics, cameras, and screen shares disabled for this particular event, um, but we do hope that you ask lots of questions of our speaker today. Um, just put those questions into the chat box, and we will get to them at the end of today's presentation, um, but feel free to put them in whenever they come to you. Wanted to also just make sure everybody knew that this um, event is being recorded and will be posted on our past seminar page in a few days. So if you miss something or you would like to see it again, feel free to um, go to our past seminar page and uh, the recording will be there. And when I get done talking, I'll put in the uh, link to that here in just a few minutes. A um, couple of very quick announcements before we get started. Um, I'm hoping that folks will also be able to join us next week on January 13th for next week's seminar when we have Francisco Giardo from the College of Forestry at Oregon State University who's going to talk to us about should we bury our forests at the bottom of the ocean to fight climate change. So that will be an interesting one and it will be another fully remote so you can join us again same link on zoom um, next week. Also wanted to promote that on January 19th, we'll have our next virtual HMSC Science on Tap event when we have Sylvia Yamada, who will be talking to us about the invasive European green crab that is um, kind of going through a little population boom in Oregon waters. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about the green crab, hoping you can join us on January 19th at 6 p.m. If you need information about any of our events or you need login details, you can go to the HMSC homepage, lo, lo, uh, scroll to the bottom, there is a calendar of events there. And if you click on it, you can get all the login details that you might need. Um, also, just letting folks know, I've got just a few more openings for February, so if anybody has another speaker they'd like to recommend, um, please reach out to me and there might be some openings where we can get some other speakers into our seminar series. But while you're all here today, um, let me tell you a little bit more about today's speaker. Um, Kara, I'm going to mess up your last name. <laughs> Everybody knows it's fine. Gadikin. Gadikin. Kara Gadikin received her bachelor's degree in biology and marine science from the College of William and Mary and is currently a marine science doctoral candidate from the University of South Alabama and Dolphin Island Sea Lab, but she has just recently defended just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we uh, will congratulate her. The graduation is going to be soon. Um, she is also a recipient of the USA 2020 Dr. Robert Ship Outstanding PhD Student Award for her dissertation work on sediment metabot and her recent award um, uh, with the um, National Science Foundation uh, Oceanography Postdoctoral Fellowship to study sediments in eelgrass habitats. Um, her research focus has been bridging the gap between biogeochemistry and ecology in sediment ecosystems. Um, she was invited today by Mary Markland, who actually saw her speak at another event um, and was able to um, invite her to join us here at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. And the wonderful thing about Zoom that we were just talking about is Kara is actually on the East Coast and is able to join us today via Zoom. So Kara, the floor is yours, please take it away. All right, uh, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Um, today I'm gonna be presenting on my dissertation work, um, Coastal Sediment Response to the Dial Oxygen Cycle. Uh, so first, I just want to see if I can get my cursor to work. There we go. <clears throat> first, I'd just like to acknowledge all the people that have helped me with this work. Um, all the Dorgan Lab members, past and present, you can see Kelly Dorgan, our fearless leader, here looking spiffy. Um, the members of my committee, um, all the people at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab who've helped me with this work, as well as friends and family and my funding sources. All right, let's get started. So this is an introduction background. 
Uh, sediments are basically like a big compost pile on the bottom of the ocean. So dead stuff settles to the ocean floor um, and dissolved oxygen in the water diffuses in. Um, and then the dead stuff is broken down by microbes in the sediment via aerobic respiration, which uses up this oxygen and the sediments release the carbon and nutrients um, back into the water. So we know that sediments do this, but there is still a, a lot of unknowns about exactly how they do this. Um, in sediments, we kind of think of this as being kind of a black box where there's processes, functions going on in the sediments that have yet to be revealed. Um, one of the things we do know though about sediments is that it has a lot of animals that live in them that are mixing them up. So um, in fauna, uh, which are a bunch of these critters in these cartoons, um, are burrowing and feeding and irrigating um, the sediments. And that activity churns up the sediment and introduces oxygen to deeper sediment layers, which then fuels increased respiration and organic matter breakdown. So the availability of oxygen is extremely important in sediments, both to the sediment microbes that are doing the bulk of the organic matter breakdown and to the animals that are facilitating that process. So then a big question is what happens to sediment ecosystems when the concentration of dissolved oxygen in the water declines? So we know that low dissolved oxygen or DO uh, can cause some pretty dramatic changes in the sediment environment, both in the sediment itself and to the animals or the fauna that live in it. So in high dissolved oxygen concentrations, we have happy mud. It's this rusty brown color, which means that the sediments are oxygenated and there's big infauna that are burrowing in the sediments, mixing it around, which enhances the sediment oxygenation. But in low dissolved oxygen conditions, uh, sediments are deoxygenated, which is this black mud of death. Um, and the infauna can't survive because they don't have any oxygen to, to breathe um, and they die off and we lose that sediment mixing function. So what this means, is that in high dissolved oxygen concentrations or conditions, there is high sediment oxygen demand or SOD, which is the flux of oxygen into the sediment. Um, and, and this we can use as a really useful proxy for the metabolism of the sediments as a whole. But in low DO, SOD drops way off um, because there's no oxygen available and the animals that could help mix the sediment and oxygenate it are all dead. Uh, so why does this even matter? Well, we know that coastal sediments are the site of really rapid carbon cycling, especially in shallow areas like in bays and estuaries. And we also know that they're disproportionately responsible for global carbon burial. And we know that they experience intense oxygen variability in the form of hypoxia and anoxia, which affect both carbon cycling and the metabolism. So in order to understand how carbon is moving around through coastal ecosystems, we have to understand the oxygen. But it's not always as simple as oxygen gets low and everything dies. One of the really interesting things about low DO is the continuum of responses that we see from infauna that may have implications for sediment function. So this is a really handy schematic by Rydell et al. They did a survey of animal behavioral responses um, and noticed the points of mortality as, as the environment was going anoxic. Um, so here, the x-axis is the duration of low oxygen. The left y-axis is the concentration of DO, which you could also think of as the severity of low DO. Um, and then there's also on the right y-axis um, included the concentration of hydrogen sulfide, which is a chemical byproduct of anaerobic respiration that's toxic to burrowing animals. Basically, it's an indicator of severe and long-term hypoxia. So when DO is very low for a very long time, things die off. Here we have mortality. When it's low for a while, say a few days or a week, you get some mortality and severe behavioral responses. But then there's this zone of short-term low oxygen, which would include the diol cycle that may affect animals sublethally, meaning not killing them off, but causing changes to their behavior. And the diol oxygen cycle isn't just a hypothetical. We see diol oxygen cycling really commonly. It's, it's very common in productive shallow water. So this is an example of summertime oxygen cycling in the bottom waters at the Arcos monitoring station at, at Dauphin Island, where I did my dissertation. So the cause of the diol cycle is photosynthesis, essentially driving dissolved oxygen up during the day when the sun is out. Um, things are photosynthesizing, producing oxygen. And then at night, sun goes away, no photosynthesis, but respiration is still chugging along. So consuming oxygen and driving DO down. And here you can see this cycling really dramatically. It can get very low, <clears throat> close to hypoxia, which is this red line at two milligrams per liter and go up and get saturated or super saturated during the day. So 
For my dissertation research, I wanted to investigate the effect this daily oxygen cycle had on sediments and the animals that live in them. And I, I did this via two main sort of branching questions. So the first question is, does sediment mac macrofaunal behavior um, and activity change throughout the diol cycle? And the way that I did this was through a lab behavior study. There was a lot of methodology that went into making this experiment happen. So an entire chapter of my dissertation was, was devising the means to test this question. Um, but then my second chapter is the experiment, um, the behavior study, observing the infauna and exposing them to diol cycling oxygen. Um, and then the second prong of my, of my dissertation work um, is addressing the question, are sediment metabolism rates throughout the diol cycle affected by the changes in infaunal behavior? So this, I, I, I built another thing, basically, because there wasn't a thing to measure the, the thing that I wanted. Um, I built some benthic metabolism chambers, a, a system to measure that, um, and then I deployed them and um, measured metabolism um, over a diol cycle. So let's get started with the behavior study. So sediment fauna can have a variety of effects, of effects on the sediment depending on the taxa. So here we have a bunch of different animals that are doing a bunch of different things, right? So we have animals that are fluidizing the sediment to burrow um, and also moving sediment from depth to the surface, that's upward conveyance. Um, we have things that are mixing sediments at the surface. We have animals that are irrigating, meaning they're flushing water, oxygenated water through the sediments so that they can breathe, but it's also oxygenating the surrounding sediments um, or ventilating something like a, a bivalve would be doing. Um, and also things like downward conveyors that are moving sediments from the surface to depth. So depending on what these animals are doing, they may have different responses to low dissolved oxygen um, that they experience in the diol cycle. So I built a, a set of hypotheses to what I thought would happen in terms of their, the, their mixing activities and their behaviors over the diol cycle. Um, so the, the first um, pattern that I hypothesized would happen would, was over the diol cycle, um, you have dissolved oxygen high during the day, getting low at night, which is this gray box, um, and then coming back up during the day. That's the diol cycle. Um, and then a proportional response would be that the behaviors are, are co-varying with the dissolved oxygen. They're dropping off um, during the night when oxygen is low and it's stressful, and then coming back during the day. Alternatively, you could see something like a gasp response, what I'm calling a gasp response, where over the diol cycle, the animals are responding to the low oxygen by dropping off their behavior, but then kind of overreacting to the return of oxygen during the day by um, it dramatically increasing their, their activity beyond what you would normally see. Um, and then a, another option that could be happening is what I'm calling a lag response, which is over the diol di cycle, they're dropping off their um, behavior, but then taking a while to recover um, so it's beneath what you would expect from something like a proportional response there, the amount of activity and, and the um, behaviors that they're performing. So how do we test this? <laughs> well, um, one way is to expose animals to a controlled diol cycle in the lab and observe their behaviors and activity and compare it at different points in the cycle. For example, comparing what they're doing during a, a um, high oxygen conditions versus low oxygen conditions, these are these red arrows, but also looking at if they're doing anything different between when oxygen is falling and when oxygen is rising at the same oxygen concentrations. So the problem with this is that it's really not easy to manipulate oxygen in the lab. It's actually a major sticking point for studies on oxygen variability. Um, most of the setups that do it are complicated or expensive or both. Um, so I needed a, a simple way to do it, so I built one. <laughs> so this I call the oxygen manipulation machine, or ohm, to be very zen about it. Um, it's a pretty simple setup, actually. So the way that it works is you have an experimental tank where you keep your replicates with your animals in there. Um, and then there's a layer of sediment at the bottom of this tank that draws down dissolved oxygen by con consuming it. Um, and then there's also a sensor that's controlled by a, the, the brains of the system, the electronics. Um, and when the oxygen level in this tank is sensed to be too low, then a valve opens up and lets in oxygenated water to the experimental tank to bump it up. So I can program the electronics to follow whatever pattern that I want, um, including a diol cycle, which I did. 
So here's what the um, what the system actually looked like when I set it all up. I have my reservoir tank with the oxygenated water, experimental tank, and the Arduino brains control system. An Arduino is just basically a, a tiny computer, a microprocessor that you can program to do whatever you want. Um, yeah, I know it looks a little janky, but <laughs> it, it actually works really well. So here is an example of a trial run of the system that I did. Um, we have the time elapsed in hours on the x-axis and dissolved oxygen um, on the y-axis. And you can see um, that it's doing a really good job of manipulating the dissolve, dissolved oxygen in that tank. Um, it can struggle a little bit on the downward slope, um, but overall it's working really well and matching that pattern really well. So I use this system, I can use this system, and I did, uh, to expose animals to the dial cycle and test their responses. Uh, so for this experiment, I chose three different taxa that were locally available. They're all suspension or surface deposit feeders. Um, there's some key differences in their physiology and their motility that provide uh, a good range of behaviors that I can use to classify their responses. I have a, a brittle star, a polychaete worm, and a burrowing clam. And I collected these animals from Petty Boy Pass, which is in between Dauphin Island and Petty Boy Island. You can see it right there. And shown here um, is the dissolved oxygen on the plot uh, for about a month around when I collected my animals. So you can see that there's a lot of oxygen variability, right? So fauna are naturally experiencing recurring low DO in their environment. Um, so I collected the animals and I brought them back to the lab um, and prepped the experiment. Um, so another big challenge actually to studying um, animals like this is how to observe behavior, behavior in sediment, sediment dwelling animals. You're literally trying to see through mud. Um, so it's difficult to observe non-invasively while also getting meaningful measurements. Um, so for this experiment, I used a couple different methods. Um, so I put the animals in uh, what I call ant farms, which are thin aquaria, in order to observe their behavior. Hopefully they would, um, their activity would be observable through the sort of plexiglass um, side of the ant farm. Um, and then I also use luminophores, which are fluorescently coated sediment particles um, to quantify mixing activity. So here you can see there's some sediment um, in a little petri dish. When you turn out the lights and shine a UV light on it, they, they glow. So you can track these particles in the sediments theoretically and use that to, to quantify mixing. So I put these animals um, from each of my taxa treatments, and I also had a, a control into the ant farms and, and let them burrow. Um, I placed them into the experimental tank and manipulated the dissolved oxygen into a diol cycle. And then I observed and recorded the animal behaviors and mixing activity. So I used the luminophores um, to quantify the mixing. And I also took time-lapse photos um, from the side so I could see what the animals were doing. Um, and these were pictures that were taken, well, once per minute. So you can see here the, the setup that I used. So I have the camera that's looking at at a, a top-down view of the surface of the ant farms, um, where, and I'm shining UV lights on them in order to see what's going on. Um, so this is the pattern that the ohm generated. Did a really good job, I think. Um, so one of the issues is that animals in, in this experiment could clear the surface luminophores within a matter of hours, which is a problem if I'm trying to measure over you know, several days, uh, uh, several day exposure. So I added more luminophores um, to the surface of this, the, the sediments at each of the blue points. Um, and then I took before and after photos for each six hour chunk of time. Um, and then I compared them um, in order to estimate the mixing for that period. So for example, in the high dissolved oxygen period we here, have here at the beginning, you see the picture I took at 0.1 and the picture I took at 0.2. Um, at point one, there's a really good coverage of the luminophores. At point two, a lot of that's been mixed. So you see this black, that's where the um, luminophores have been mixed down. And we can compare that to what's going on in the low DO period, where it looks pretty much the same at the beginning and the end of that, that chunk of time. So uh, what did I find? Well, I'm first just going to show you the plot of the control treatment. Um, so this is the same plot that you've been seeing before. We have the time uh, elapsed in on the, the x-axis and the dissolved oxygen on the y-axis, but I've added this second y-axis here on the right, which is the luminophore cover. So here, the more negative the value, the greater the change in the luminophore cover and the more mixing. Um, so it's corresponding to these points up here. 
So here there's a line at zero, that means nothing was mixed. Um, so I'm just going to put up the, the other plots so you can see them and then I'll talk about them. So here we have the brittle star, um, the worm, and the clam. And I'll get rid of the controls because we know that nothing changed there, which is what we wanted. Um, so the first thing we notice is that they all follow a similar general pattern. Um, they start with really high mixing. I remember high, more negative, lower on the plot. Um, high mixing, and then it decreases and kind of converges on zero, but with kind of a punctuated change within the diol cycle. But remember that our question was about the response to the diol cycle, that proportional or the gas for the lag. Um, so we can do that by comparing each of these chunks of time and the high and the low. So when we test that, we only really see an irregular response in the first diol cycle of the brittle star here, where it looks like there's a gas response going on, where the um, mixing activity after that, um, that the lowest point is significantly greater than it was before. But we didn't see that same thing in the second diol cycle. So generally, what looks like it is going on is that it's proportional response in, in all of these animals. But that's not the whole story because we still have this overall pattern, right? Of the generally decreasing, but also punctuated change. So this pattern that shows up in, in each of these taxa looks kind of like the combination of two different responses, right? So we have the variation that's occurring within the diol cycle as a response to that, but also what I'm calling acclimation um, that's occurring across the diol cycles. So with this in mind, we can actually write an equation and apply a fit to the data to describe this pattern. So once we have this equation and we've added our fits um, to the data, we can calculate the confidence intervals for the coefficients of the equation, which are the, the letter variables here. So A, B, and C in particular, uh, to determine the significance of this, this fit to the data. So if the confidence intervals don't include zero, then the possibility that the term doesn't have any explanatory power for the data set is minimal, and then to the term as a whole is significant. So what we found is that all of the A, B, and C coefficients were significant, except for the A coefficient for the brittle star data. Um, so the, the, that was the one for the variation term here for the explaining with dissolved oxygen. So the brittle star mixing activity is mostly explained by this acclimation component. So what that means is that overall, we're seeing that in terms of their mixing activity, fauna are responding proportionally to di diol dissolved oxygen, but they're also changing their response over multiple diol cycles. So the next question is, do the animal's behaviors match or explain the sediment mixing patterns? So first I need to tell you a little bit more about each of the texts that I use. So here we have the brittle star. Um, they're really interesting animals, I think. Um, so they uh, build subsurface burrows and extend their each of their little spindly arms up to suspension or surface deposit feed. Um, they will also ventilate this burrow with an undulating arm motion. So if this is their arms, they kind of they do a little bit of this. <laughs> um, and they will excavate the sediments from uh, their burrow and then deposit it in a pile at the surface. And uh, one of the interesting things about um, brittle stars is that diol activity has actually been observed in, in brittle stars before um, uh, with a, a photo period. So this is a plot from Rosenberg and Lundberg 2004 um, who tested this. Sorry if this plot is a little bur blurry, but basically what's going on is as the photosynthetic active radiation or the you know, sunlight goes away, um, you see an increase in the amount of activity, which here is being quantified by the number of arms that are visible protruding up from the sediment. Um, and as soon as the light comes back, then their arms go away. So we thought it would be interesting to see if diol oxygen is also affecting activity as measured by their, the, you know, the number of arms. So our hypothesis here was that they would have more arms up in low DO to increase ventilation, um, and they would be doing less excavating at that time as well. Uh, moving on, so the polychaete worm, Oenia fusiformis, uh, these worms will build uh, their tube out of little bits of shell and um, kind of in a shingled manner, and they can alter their tube position in the sediment by ratcheting it up and down, um, which is funny to watch. Um, so they feed and also respire with this frilly crown um, that can, they can also retract into their tube. 
and they suspension feed or deposit feed um, around in the area around their tube. So uh, previous research has shown that these animals uh, tolerate sustained low DO by becoming quiescent. Basically, they stop, they stop doing anything. Um, so our, our hypothesis here was that the worm would spend more of its time with its crown elevated than down deposit feeding in low DO, trying to you know, respire as much as possible in, in low dissolved oxygen conditions and doing less uh, feeding. And lastly, we have the burrowing clam, Ameritella versicolor. This is a really small body clam. The shell is maybe you know, like a centimeter long. They're, they're teeny tiny. Um, and they bury themselves in the sediment and they feed using a long extendable siphon and they probe around the surrounding sediments and along the surface. <clears throat> so larger clams, um, larger you know, species of clams have been shown to periodically ventilate the sediment by ejecting water from their mantle cavity. This is petal gape ejection, it's known as petal gape ejection. So this is a plot from Camelini et al. Um, showing the oxygenation in the sediments at various locations around a buried a clam's shell as it ventilates. And you can see um, as we go along in time, this is the, the concentration of oxygen on the y-axis. Um, and you can see the pulses of oxygen occurring at a scale of about five to 10 minutes. So um, we thought it was pretty likely that even though this clam is smaller, they would be doing a similar ventilation behavior. Um, and that the clam would ventilate and feed less often with falling DO and then spike its activity when DO rises to recover um, because they're very active um, respirers, for lack of a better word. Uh, so what did we find? So we observed some pretty cool behaviors and I'll go through each of the taxa in turn. Um, there's this ever present visibility issue, right? With studying animals that live in mud, they're, they're hard to see. However, one of the brittle stars cooperated very nicely and burrowed directly against a wall of the ant farm. So you can see all of its arms, its central disc. You can see the arms here. Hopefully you guys can see, oh, I'll use my little laser pointer. There we go. So um, you can see all of its arms sticking up. It has four arms up here and one down here anchoring in the, the, um, the sediment. And you can see its central disc right about here. You can also see that its burrow is well oxygenated by the coloration along its wall. So it's this light brown um, along the sides versus the dark brown or grays that you get out in the, the bulk sediment. Um, and they are highly active animals. So here you can see what I call a cartwheel. Um, they move around a lot and they do this weird thing where they'll take one arm from suspension feeding um, or surface deposit feeding and move it down and switch with another arm. Um, so they're, they're doing a lot down there. Um, we could also see them excavating. Uh, so this animal gave us a great demonstration on how they excavate their burrows. Um, basically by passing clumps of mud along their tube feet, past its oral disc and up to the surface. It kind of looks like a volcano on the surface actually. Um, and you can see the pink luminophores um, deep down here in the burrow. So the surface sediments where that, those luminophores were are moving down and it's, it's probably from burrow collapse. And then the brittle stars are taking that sediment and redepositing it at the surface to make sure that they have burrow space. Um, so what did we see in terms of their behavior across the, um, the exposure that I did? So this is a plot of their behavior through time. The shades of red indicate the number of arms extended above the surface. Um, so we found that the proportion of time each animal spent during each, each of these intervals that I measured it, um, performing each behavior averaged between them um, and then compared all of them to each other. So they have three or four arms up most of the time and arm number does not vary with the dial cycle, which is an interesting contrast to the photo period experiment that was done before. Um, and the time spent excavating did not seem to vary with the dial cycle. Uh, so for the worm, um, this is a, a short chunk of video. You can see it deposit feeding. It's very cute. It has that frilly crown out and you can see um, it bending its crown down to the surface, moving around as it forms this feeding pit directly around its, its tube. Worm poop. <laughs> they also um, will poop at the surface um, periodically and where they will pull their, their crown in um, and then um, poop at the surface I and mean, you can see the pink luminophore particles in the poop pile. So we know that it is clearing them from the surface sediments because it's pooping them out. So when we look at their behaviors, 
we see that they vary widely in the time that's spent deposit feeding versus suspension feeding or respiring between the different individuals. Um, and here there was no pattern driven by the diol cycle either. Uh, when we look at the burrowing clam, here we can see that the clam is feeding and using its, its siphon, the, that extendable siphon, burrowing around in the sediment. Um, and the siphon can extend really far, often the, the full length of the ant farm. Um, and you can see the little siphon tunnel, like here's a little siphon tunnel where it poked its siphon out and then you know, retracted it and moved it somewhere else. Um, and we can see them vent, we can literally see them ventilating the sediment too. Um, so you can see the pulsing of the sediment. You can even here see the sediment cracking. So this means that this, this teeny tiny clam is shifting the entire weight of the overlying sediment upwards with each ventil ventilatory cycle, which is just, it's crazy to me. Um, and it's really fast too. So the pulsing here occurs on a frame to frame time scale, which if you remember, I took pictures every one minute. So that translates in real time to a minute to minute pulsing. Um, and you can tell here that the clam is moving around because the, the focal point of the pulsing shifts. So here it's pulsing, oh, moved over there. Um, so the big takeaway is that these clams are highly active, maybe, maybe a little too active because when I measured what they were doing, they were doing it all of the time. <laughs> Didn't see any pattern really. They were visibly ventilating in the sediment most of the time and did not stop in Modio. Um, and the feeding could be seen much of the time and covered a large, very large spatial area. And, and so it didn't see an effect of the oxygen cycle. So we know that the mixing activity is changing with DO, right? And that it's changing also over multiple cycles, but we don't see that effect in the behavior. So what gives? <laughs> well, it could be that the meaningful differences in behaviors are occurring between really difficult to di differentiate behaviors. So. This would be in particular for the brittle star and the Oenia, where the difference between suspension feeding and irrigating or suspension feeding and respiring in the case of the worm is really hard to tell just by a still image um, or even by um, a video that is not very high resolution. Or it could also be that they are occurring on shorter time scale. These behaviors are occurring on shorter time scales than was picked up by our photos. Um, so this would, could possibly be the case for the clam ventilation, which was unexpectedly fast, way faster than what we saw, um, what, what has been seen for other clams, right, for the, the larger clams. Um, so you may need greater temporal resolution to pick up on these changes. It, it may not be that they stop ventilating, but that they change the frequency of ventilation or the pattern um, or the intensity of that, the, the pedal gape ejection. Um, all right. So move along to the field metabolism study. So just as a reminder, um, sediment oxygen demand, remember, is this metric that we can use to estimate metabolism in sediment. Um, and in a long-term low oxygen, we know that it tends to drop off substantially. Um, so if we were to hypothesize how SOD um, varies along a diol cycle, it would be reasonable to expect that in sediments with low faunal abundance, it would be high SOD during the day and low SOD at night. So when there's plenty of oxygen around, it makes sense that you would get more oxygen consumption. Um, when oxygen drops off, you get less. Um, this is basically the proportional response from before of that hypothesis, but applied to sediment metabolism. So if we were then to hypothesize the effect of fauna on SOD, we might expect this kind of response where they drive much higher SOD um, during the day uh, due to their high activity, because there's plenty of oxygen around. But when DO gets low at night, the animals become stressed and they decrease their activity. So then why hasn't this been done in the field? It may seem like an easy problem, but it's, again, actually really difficult to measure SOD, particularly in situ. So there are two main methods that people use generally to measure SOD, batch style chambers and eddy correlation technique. So batch style benthic chambers are long used um, to, to measure fluxes, all types of fluxes. Um, and they're useful because they isolate a patch of sediment and the fauna, but they typically are only really deployed once a day or maybe a couple times a day. So they have pretty high spatial resolution. You can get you know, a, a very distinct small patch of sediment, but they have very low temporal resolution because your deployments are 
not that many. Um, there's a newer method that has been coming around in the last couple of decades, been developed um, called the eddy correlation technique, which calculates oxygen flux from the flow field above the sediment surface. Um, so it has very high temporal resolution. Um, it can measure, you know, on a minute to minute basis. Um, but the spatial resolution is very low. It's best understood as kind of a spatially average measurement of fluxes um, on the order of meters. So we need a methodology to bridge this gap between spatial and temporal resolution in SOD measurement in order to measure what I want to measure um, and to also incorporate the effect of sediment fauna over time. So I, I made a thing to do that. I can't seem to stop building things. Uh, the setup consists of a central housing, which you can see here, that contains the electronics and power of the system. Um, I know that it looks kind of like a bomb, but it says right on it, not a bomb, so it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and then the central housing controls five replicate benthic chambers that are deployed with it. So the way that this works is you have the central housing that's controlling a pump that will approximately every 20 minutes or so, it will turn on this pump to flush the overlying water in this chamber with water of the ambient oxygen concentration um, it, just from the environment. And there's also a, a pump designated to, with a little stir bar to mix the overlying water. Um, so here you can get replicate measurements basically through time in situ of SOD. So here you can see a early version of the chamber. With, this is before I added the mixing impeller. Um, during this is a, a test run of the system. You can see here this hobo, which is a dissolved oxygen logger. So it's measuring the oxygen concentration in this overlying water of the chamber as it's declining through time. So theoretically, the data that I get back should look something like this schematic, where we have the ambient dissolved oxygen here um, that we're measuring, following you know roughly a, a diol cycle, and then we have the dissolved oxygen being measured by that oxygen logger in the chamber as kind of the sawtooth pattern where each of the, um, the, the lengths or I guess widths of this sawtooth is a, about a 20 minute incubation because that's how often it's flushing the chambers. Um, and then once it gets to this low point after 20 minutes, the pump will turn on and refresh the overlying water back to the ambient oxygen concentration. Because remember it's pulling water from the ambient environment. So we can take the slopes of these saw teeth um, and calculate sediment oxygen demand from it. The slope of this is basically the oxygen consumption over time. And we can do that for each of the teeth and compare at different points in the diol cycle. So for this experiment, um, I picked a site that was close to home, Bonsacore Bay in Mobile Bay, Alabama. It's just across the bay from us. Um, and I did, three 24-hour deployments and collected DO data, um, both ambient and the DO in the chambers. And this was a, a shallow, sandy site with easy shore access. Um, and I collected the faunal communities after each deployment um, in each chambers. Um, oh, also, the, the chambers were covered with duct tape to shade them and isolate the effect of respiration and exclude photosynthesis. So we're just looking at, at respiration here. Um, I had one problem child chamber where the pump was acting up during all the deployments. So we have four replicates for each of the three deployments. Um, so this is the plot of the ambient DO that was measured in all three deployments to see if it, it did a diol thing. Um, we have the time of day here on the x-axis. The gray shaded is nighttime. And on the uh, y-axis, we have the dissolved oxygen concentration. So it's following a diol cycle in all three, um, which is good. And it's actually getting pretty low, um, three and a half, four milligrams per liter. So then the next question is, does the chamber measure SOD, AKA does it sawtooth? So this is the data from one of the chambers plotted also with the dissolved oxygen, um, with the, the ambient dissolved oxygen. So ambient is in blue and the chambers are in the black. So we do see, the sawtooth pattern. Um, another thing to note is that the oxygen at the peaks of each of the teeth are matching or getting close to matching the ambient dissolved oxygen. So we can reasonably associate each of these measurements with a given ambient dissolved oxygen in the diol cycle, right? So next question after this is, can we calculate SOD from this? So here uh, we have the same plot, but I've overlain the um, SOD data from this particular chamber. 
Um, and we added a, a right y-axis here. This is sediment oxygen demand. So a, a thing to note is that the SOD axis is inverted. So more SOD means lower on the plot, more oxygen going into the sediment. So what we can see here is, yes, we can calculate SOD um, and use it to answer the question, does ambient DO drive variation in SOD throughout the diode cycle? <clears throat> so first I'll just show you the, the data and then I'll talk about it because there's a lot going on. Um, so we have the data from our first deployment, the second deployment and the third deployment. All the axes are the same, it should look very similar. So the first thing we notice is that there's a lot of variability but remember that our question is about whether SOD is responding proportionally to change in DO. So if there were a proportional relationship, we would expect that when we plot the SOD measurements against the DO concentration at the time that the measurement was taken, we would see this relationship, a positive relationship. Um, so do we see that? No, not at all. It looks pretty random, kind of like you know buckshot on the side of a barn. Um, and there's no significance to the relationship. So what's going on here? Um, at this point, I decided to kind of back up and just do some regression analysis to figure out what was going on. Um, so in a multiple regression with DO concentration and faunal biomass as factors, you see that DO is not having a significant influence on SOD, but biomass is. And the interaction between DO and biomass is also having an effect on SOD. So there's something going on between the DO and the fauna. So we should probably take a look at what the critters were that were in the samples and relate that back to what we saw. So when we look at the faunal community, we see, again, a lot of variability, both in the amount and the types of animals. So this top plot here is um, abundance of each of the taxa. I know it's really small, but you don't, you don't need to <laughs> know what all of them are. Um, and the bottom plot is the biomass of the dominant taxa. Um, though there was a, a decent amount of diversity across samples, biomass was dominated by myriads and orbinian worms, which are big burrowing deposit feeders. So there was also a big burrowing worm fish in sample 11, you can see here. Um, so from now on, I'm just going to be using the biomass data since it's reasonable to assume that SOD would scale well with that. <clears throat> so. When we look at the relationship between the biomass of the samples and all of their SOD measurements, we see a significant positive relationship. That's what's here. So this means that the presence of fauna is driving overall greater SOD. And we can even actually see the effect of that, a big burrowing taxa when we look at sample 11, remember that, that's the one that had that worm fish in it, um, which is likely irrigating and making the SOD disproportionately greater in that sample. It's, you see, it's kind of sticking up a little bit from the line there. Um, so we know why the relationship between SOD and fauna was significant. It's that the animals are driving higher sediment oxygen consumption with their activity. But that doesn't, inter that doesn't explain the interaction with dissolved oxygen. So if we go back to that relationship of DO and SOD and we just plot each of the chambers by itself, a relationship starts to emerge. So in low biomass samples, like for example, sample number two, um, SOD decreases as DO decreases. But in high biomass samples, um, like for example, sample three, it does the opposite, increasing when DO decreases. So this means that not only are fauna driving higher SOD, but they're changing the relationship between DO and SOD altogether throughout the diode cycle. Um, so if we were to plot the slopes of that relationship between DO and SOD for all of the samples against the faunal biomass, the resulting relationship is significant. And also note that the regression crosses the line at zero, which means that the slope switches from positive to negative with increasing faunal biomass. Again, here we can also see sample 11 being weird with that worm fish. Here it means that the sample has a greater than expected increase in SOD with declining DO. Basically what this means is that the presence of fauna flips the relationship between DO and SOD. And I know that sounds like kind of confusing, so let me show you another way. Um, so when there isn't a big presence of fauna, SOD is following our expected proportional response. So yes, higher SOD during the day, lower SOD at night, and it increases again on the next day. 
And remember that this is what we thought would happen when there were a lot of fauna present, with that there would be much higher SOD during the day and it would get really low at night. But what is actually happening is the opposite. <laughs> so fauna are driving greater SOD at night, likely from their irrigation activity. So that's what I mean by fauna flipping the relationship between DO and SOD, which I, I think is pretty cool. Um, so another thing that we notice, remember, is that high variability, specifically between adjacent measurements of these deployments. So here we could ask the question, is the point to point variability greater when the fauna are present? That's a question, sorry. Um, so we can observe this difference directly by looking at samples with high faunal populations, um, like we see in a couple of the samples in deployment one, um, versus samples with very little fauna, like pretty much all the samples in deployment two. So this took a bunch of complicated statistical gymnastics to figure out, and I will save you the boredom of hearing me explain it. <laughs> but basically, the short answer to this question is yes, point-to-point -point variability is greater in samples with a lot of fauna. So we know that fauna are increasing SOD at night. So this is the revised hypothesis, remember, based on the relationship between DO and SOD. But with our new knowledge about the variability, we can say it would be more like this, with fauna driving greater overall SOD, but also large changes moment to moment. Um, so we know that fauna don't tend to irrigate constantly and at the same rate, but will cycle through phases of activity and rest as they're irrigating. So it's reasonable to hypothesize that this is what's driving the greater variability in sediments with more fauna. So we've covered a lot. <laughs> what have we learned? Um, so first of all, I, in order to, to learn anything about the behavior that the animals were doing over the dial cycle, I had to build a system to measure it. Um, so a major hurdle to studying variable DO is, is the challenge of manipulating it in the lab. Um, so I built a, a system to do that. Um, and uh, in using it, um, I found out that the in faunal sediment mixing um, responds proportionally to the dial cycle and it also decreases over multiple cycles. And the mixing variation wasn't explained by the behaviors that we characterized, but those differences may emerge with more specific behavior differentiation um, or with looking at the behavior frequency instead of the existence or not existence of that behavior at any given time. Um, overall, we found that fauna may mix sediments in situ at lower rates than predicted by most lab studies, because most lab studies do not alter their oxygen concentrations when they're looking at, at sediment mixing. They keep it high and stable. Um, so if they're, if this is the way that animals are responding in situ, um, they might be mixing at much lower rates than, than what those lab studies would be predicting. Um, Chapter three, I, I built a whole system to measure SOD in the, um, in the field to capture both temporal and spatial SOD variability. Um, and I didn't really talk about this much when I was explaining the system, but there's a ton of possibilities with this setup. Um, so an interesting um, thing to do, remember how I, I said that the chambers were covered in, in duct tape um, to prevent photosynthesis? Uh, a really interesting thing to do would be to remove that duct tape on some of the replicates so you can get an idea of how the balance between photosynthesis and respiration between oxygen production and consumption is changing throughout the diol cycle and with the presence of fauna. And there's you know a ton more possibilities that I, I don't think I fully appreciated when I first built the system. Like I built it to do a thing and then over the after it was like, oh, you could do this. I'm like, oh, I could do that. Um, so in the field metabolism study, we found that there was this interaction between the diol cycle and faunal behavior that drives greater and more variable SOD. So fauna are flipping the DO-SOD relationship throughout the diol cycle, which is increasing SOD at night. Um, so what this means for people who are interested in sediment functions and, and SOD is that we can't really extrapolate daytime SOD patterns to night. And most, most SOD measurements are made at least during, at least with, with benthic chambers, which is the most commonly used method, are made during the day. Um, and it's important to increase both the spatial and the temporal resolution of SOD measurements in order to describe, fully describe on, on a short time scale, what's happening with this sediment function. So overall, 
fauna are showing a unique in res response to diol cycling, both in their mixing activity that we saw with the behavior study and their influence on SOD, which we saw in the metabolism study. Um, it's also interesting to think about combining the two, the results of these two studies, which paints an interesting potential picture of the dynamics of faunal activity and behavior throughout the diol cycle. So where they may be mixing, feeding, burrowing through sediments during the day when the DO is high, um, as indicated by the behavior study, and shifting to predominantly bioirrigating at night under stressful low oxygen conditions, as demonstrated by the metabolism study. So this can have major implications for our understanding of how these animals are modifying the sediment environment and sediment function as a whole. So I, I hope that I've convinced you that an accurate view of how coastal sediments function must consider the diol oxygen cycle and its effect on sediment fauna. Um, thank you for listening and I'll take any questions. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. I tend to talk fast when I'm excited. No, you're great. Thank you so very much. That was really yeah. interesting. Um, so everyone online, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll read them out. Um, and while folks are typing and kind of organizing their thoughts, I had a quick question for you sure. about um, the uh, lab experiment um, mm -hmm. and the animals that you collected. Um, how did you, um, so it was, it's more about the acclimation component. So if yeah. they're coming from a, a, a natural environment where they're possibly um, seeing cycles of oxygen yeah. and then were they held in a tank where they didn't and then did you put them into an experiment where they were and yes. whether that was thought of so could you talk a little bit about that yeah so i i collected the animals held them in a uh basically just an aerated tank um while i was prepping the experiment and then put them into the um the experimental tank and expose them to the, the cycling oxygen. So that's that's why I think that it's interesting to think. So the, the mixing rates that we saw at the beginning were presumably similar to the mixing rates you would see if you were just holding them at stable high oxygen, because there was that short period of, of high oxygen conditions that they were exposed to at the very beginning of the exposure. So that's why I'm thinking like most people are just seeing that. <laughs> And the acclimation, it might not actually be, it's, it's acclimation in a lab setting, right? It's acclimation to the pattern that I exposed them to. But theoretically, if they're experiencing all of that variation every day in, in situ, they would have much lower rates, like we were seeing them sort of get to near the end of the exposure. So I, I don't think they're like, I think that they were acclimating, but they were acclimating to a lab uh, to lab conditions that I exposed them to. And I think we were getting towards the point where we would see, okay, when oxygen is varying, what, what would they actually be doing? And there's only so long that I could run the experiment. They were very labor intensive to do, but getting the data back, I was like, oh, it would have been so nice to run this for just a couple more days to see what happened. But, you know, hindsight. Uh, I <laughs> and I, before I read your next question, I just wanted to, um, say how much I appreciated your brittle star uh, ventilation dance. That was <laughs> Thank awesome. Thank you. Yes. I, was, I was explicitly instructed my, by my advisor that I had to put that in my dissertation defense. I had to do a little dance, so I did It's it. great. Yeah. It's great. Um, okay, so we have a question here. Um, oh, it just jumped. Hang on just a second. They're coming in too quick. Um, so Michael uh, wanted to, he said, congratulations, amazing presentation. Um, can you please describe um, how you'll use what you learned in your postdoc? Oh yeah, okay. So my postdoc, um, I can give a little, back, a little bit of background on what, what I'm planning to do for my postdoc. So um, my postdoc is focused on understanding the below ground environment of seagrass, uh, ecosystems um, and characterizing both the physical structure of their roots, but also the chemical environment around that structure. Because we don't really don't know that much about the environment that that's creating for um, both microbes and um, the animals that are living in seagrass sediments, which could be really important for understanding how seagrasses um, are, are functioning. So one of the things that I, I really took away from my, um, my dissertation work and carried into the, the proposal that I wrote for my postdoc was the 
just the dynamism of, of oxygen in marine environments. Um, and it's really important to understand on a on a, a, a small scale level, what is going on with oxygen, um, because that has, when you scale it up, major implications for how sediments are, are, are working as a whole. Um, in my dissertation, I was focusing on, on temporally how that is varying um, on, a, on a very short time scale. But for my, post, for my postdoc, I'm planning on looking spatially how does it vary mm -hmm. in seagrass ecosystems, because they're, they're known to leak oxygen out of their roots. Um, and we don't, really know that much about how that changes the sediment environment. Um, so it was it was good practice for me <laughs> to to start thinking about oxygen in a, in a more, I guess, holistic way across both temporal but also spatial scales. Nice. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, so next question we have is from Claire. She says, great talk. How might diurnal changes in organic matter inputs link to net primary production compounds in the faunal response to oxygen? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. So I don't, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, can you read it again? I'm not sure I, I, I fully. Yeah, can you pull up the chat still? Oh, sure, can you yeah, see yeah. it? You might be able to. Yep. Um, and it's under Claire, oh, okay. I see. and it says, how might diurnal changes in organic matter inputs link to net primary production compounds in faunal responses to oxygen? Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of organic matter inputs, um, you're talking specifically like labile organic matter that's, that's settling to the surface, varying over a diol scale. Um, I don't know that much about how how it varies, um, but I can. Oh. Did I miss a? You're doing okay. To that question. Um. Make it more. Yeah, it would make it more complicated. <laughs> it would make it a lot more complicated. Um, but this, yeah, this work can be complexified in, in many different directions. It was, a, it was a, a struggle to keep it as simple as it was. Um, so it, I'm not sure I completely understand the question here. So let me see, um, Claire, are you willing to, if I allow you to unmute, let me see if I can find you. Do you wanna ask your question verbally? So Claire, you can unmute if you would like. Hi, <laughs> sorry, I, I don't think by compound, I meant make it more complicated. So, compound, okay. Um, so in other words, I mean, I think you had a great experimental design where you were just really looking at the influence of changing oxygen, but in the real world there on top of that there are other things that are changing like oh absolutely yeah <laughs> like the the amount of um organic matter that's coming into the benthos um yeah. that's being or being produced you know and so i i was just trying to get to the point of you know it, there could be even more complicating factors Absolutely, yeah. In in the actual environment, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and it's compounding factors. Yeah, it's especially <laughs> in because the, there's, it's characteristic that these systems are very shallow too, right? Where there's diol oxygen cycling, it's that where where the dynamic oxygen change is happening is also tends to be very shallow, which is receiving, also in you know in relation to that it being shallow and near the coast, it's receiving more and also a wider variety of, of qualities of organic matter. Um, I think that would, would require a whole other <laughs> dissertation, to be honest. But yeah. Um, yeah, depending on the light exposure, you would expect, I guess, some variability with, say, like the, the microphytobenthos um, and how that would affect the oxygen concentrations. Um, yeah, short answer, I don't know. That's an interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, you should let other people ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claire. 
Um, John has a question, I think that kind of builds on that just a little bit. He was interested in knowing, um, are the sediments beneath the burrowing depths different in oxygen concentrations? And what might the animals be getting from the sediments around them, basically? Mm, yes, they, they do. Well, there's, there is a generally accepted in sediment science global average burrowing depth of about 15 centimeters. But there's a lot of complexity that surrounds that. Um, so that's that's considered to be the the mixed layer in in sediments. But depending on the sediments on on the sediment type and also the animals that are living in the sediment, you would get a variety of influences on the the oxygenation, but also just the sediment structure, um, depending on those factors. The sediments that are beneath that mixed layer. Um, tend to be anoxic. Um, I believe that they can also, they, they vary in, um, in like the, the technical, the, the, the mechanical properties of the sediments, um, because in the, in the bioturbated later, they're literally mixing it up, mixing up the sediments, loosening it up, um, which along with that would go along with greater permeability of sediments. So below this mixed layer, it tends to be compressed, um, anoxic black mud, <laughs> basically. So uh, the vast majority of that, of the activity um, and the influence is happening in, in what is in realistically a very thin layer right at the surface, but it's an incredibly important layer because that's where all of the, the fluxes are happening. That's where the animal activity is happening. And of course, there's there's variability depending on you know what what system you're talking about, but generally, yeah. This next question actually has three parts, and we're running short on time, um, but I'll hit you with a couple of them, and we'll see how we do. Um, let's see. Uh, do you think there would be a difference in SOD in uh, it, how do you think SOD would change if it was consistently dark, like mm. in deeper environments? Mm -hmm. um, how do I think SOD would change um, with a diol cycle or I'll just, I'll answer I'm the question that I think you're asking. It says if you're, so adding on to that, these questions are difficult when we're doing it this way, isn't it? Yeah. Um, referring to organisms that are acclimated to the dark. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the, the influence that I think that animals would have on SOD in environments that are typically dark, um, so they theoretically would not be responding to light exposure, which was that, that, that inconsistency that we saw in the brittle stars of, okay, they don't seem to be varying their behavior with um, with the, the amount of dissolved oxygen, um, but they are varying their mixing activity, which I, I think is just a factor of the, the measurements that we were taking in the way that we were taking them. Um, so inconsistently, consistently dark, um, at, at consistently dark depths, you would also expect, expect those at those depths to be deeper. <laughs> and when they're deeper, they're less prone to diol oxygen cycling. So that's kind of a, a tricky question to answer. Um, theoretically, they would also be responding behaviorally to varying dissolved oxygen, but they would not really be encountering the diol cycle as, as much because deeper in deeper environment, less less coastal environments, less dynamic environments, uh, DO tends to be more stable, um, more influenced by, by like passing water bodies and things like that, rather than the, the influence of, of the balance between photosynthesis and respiration. Um, so I was just gonna ask if you are willing to put your um, contact information into the chat for folks oh, sure. that have some yeah. of these questions that are a little bit more than maybe we can answer in a quick, um, Mm -hmm. Zoom conversation, and that way folks can reach directly out to you, um, because as you're finding, we have some folks that are really interested in some of the specifics that you found. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. I'm referring to actual to organisms acclimated to dark and yes, with the diol cycle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for everybody who asked questions, I for, forgive me for not getting to them all. We are um, out of time and we are at a time difference between uh, East Coast and West Coast, which I also want to respect. Ah. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's, it's 7.30 here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so once Kara gets her information, her contact information into the chat so everybody can see that, um, I just wanted to thank her very much for spending time with us and sharing her information. Um, and you might be seeing it, but you're getting all sorts of thank yous and Zoom Absolutely. congratulations and hand claps and all yeah. the good things. And um, please, please email me questions um, where I can respond ad nauseum. <laughs> Uh, and and for those that are online um, in a part of the Hatfield community, I think maybe we should try to figure out how to get Kara to come out here and visit us. Um, I think that please bring me pretty... to Oregon, please. <laughs> um, one of the questions we didn't get a that. chance to ask is that Hatfield has just set up an innovation lab, um, which is specifically set up to help students and our researchers design program or design instrumentation just like you built. Oh, that's um, so exciting! I'm so I'm so, so it'd happy be really about that. fun for you to yeah. come and one help guide us in some of the like what did you need what were the things that you weren't able to do um, yeah. that we might be able to accommodate mm -hmm. within our innovation lab um, yeah so I have I have a lot of thoughts about that because we have something very <laughs> similar that that my advisor Kelly has been developing at the C lab with you know curriculum and and relationships with our technical support department it's yeah it's great. Nice. Yeah. So let's build that relationship and keep this kind of conversation going. And for the, yeah, uh, everybody again online is just saying thank you. Great stuff. Um, easy thank to follow. Thank you so much. So we really appreciated it. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, we'll continue this conversation offline. It sounds like. And Kara, I will reach out to you and see if we can figure out how to get you out here. Um, for everybody great. online, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope that you have a good rest of your day and that you're able to join us again next week. Um, remember, we have a pretty interesting conversation that we'll have about sinking our forest for climate change. So that'll be really fun. Hope to uh, see you next week. And Kara, thank you again so much. Thank um, you all. And <laughs> We hopefully will talk to you again and maybe someday see you in the uh, face to face. So thank yes. you, everybody. All right. Bye now. I'm going to go ahead and end this presentation. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Kara. Bye. <laughs>